How cool is this? That's really cool. So it didn't get dark. There's your ring of fire. On October 14th, at approximately 10.30 a.m., the sun and moon were aligned with southeast Utah to create an annual eclipse, also known as the Ring of Fire, something that won't happen again in the U.S. for another 16 years. We knew that we had to go see it and made it part of a week-long trip in southern Utah where we'd also experience incredible moonscapes, pristine night skies, beautiful mountain roads with fall colors, fun trails, and unforgettable memories. We are in southern Utah in Valley of the Gods for the Ring of Fire Eclipse. The line, the best place to see the eclipse, basically goes right through the center of the valley here. So we're going to head through it and then head up to a spot to camp where there's going to be a really good view, hopefully. Valley of the Gods is a small loop through some of southern Utah's most beautiful buttes. The area is popular year-round, and it's not uncommon to see people camped out there enjoying the sights, but the day before the eclipse was like nothing I've ever seen before. There were people, vehicles, and travel trailers everywhere. It is insanely busy down here in Valley of the Gods, which is obviously to be expected, but every single campsite, every single little lay-by, and uh, even some places where I'm pretty sure you shouldn't be driving uh, are all packed up with vehicles everywhere. Thankfully, we have Andreas on this trip, and he uh, actually scouted out a spot and found it for us, and he is reserving it. So we're heading up there now. The Moki Dugway is a series of steep switchbacks that climb 1,200 feet up towards Muley Point. As we climbed, we knew that we'd be in for a great view. Well, we found Andreas and he has saved us a fantastic spot at the top here with the cliffs just over there. In fact, very short walk over to the edge. Let's take a look. All right, just gonna step across the rocks. Gotta be careful not to step on this dirt. Can't remember what that stuff is. It's got a name, but it, uh, you don't wanna step on it. It's bad for it. And here we are, right on the edge of the cliff. This is a fantastic spot with views right across the valley out there. Andreas did good, he found us a good spot. We've got a couple other people coming in. Uh, we've got Jevin, should be here in about an hour. 
rolling in in his gladiator uh, and then Justin is coming in late tonight uh, he has been delayed because he just got back from a vacation uh, and he's the one that's bringing the glasses for us and they're kind of important if we don't have those we'll just be I almost looked at the sun then to demonstrate uh, we won't be looking at the sun because that wouldn't be very smart Today is the day of the eclipse, and this is the lens that we're gonna be shooting it on. Justin came in last night and he's brought us a 400 to 600 millimeter lens, and it makes the sun really big. So I'm excited, I'm ready. We've got about 30 to 40 minutes to go, and it's gonna happen. I didn't realize this, but while I was shooting the introduction, the eclipse has actually started. The moon is just starting to creep across in front of the sun. I think we've still got another uh, 25 minutes or so until the actual total eclipse or until the moon's fully covering it or as much as it does with the uh, annular eclipses. Uh, but we're still got all the cameras out pointing in the right direction. So about 10 minutes away now and it's gotten strangely it's like half light now and uh it's also gotten a lot colder it's getting close imagine being in ancient times you have no idea what's going on all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. it's cold and then the cold and dark yeah. oh look here it comes oh yeah it's about to make its way out how cool is this Woo! look at that that's really cool so it didn't get dark there's your ring of fire I wonder what their little shadows look like now. Can I do a... Oh yeah, look at that! Whoa, that's a trip. One of the really cool things is the shadows all have little rings in them. So like even the leaves under the bushes or if we hold our hands out and create a little gap, the shadow shows a perfect silhouette of the eclipse. A big part of the attraction of the eclipse is the opportunity for us to film it. Looking back at the footage, we noticed that Justin caught a plane quickly pass in front of the sun. That's really cool. You can see, even through these glasses now, you can kind of see the flare around the sun. It's almost over. Here it comes again, brighter again. The video came out great, although the footage doesn't give the experience of the cold or the strange half-light. So that was your first solar eclipse. What did you think? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> loved it. Absolutely loved it. Well, it's over and the exodus has begun. There's a long line of vehicles driving down the switchbacks over there. I bet Valley of the Gods is a nightmare right now. So we're going to pack up slowly. We'll take our time. That way we're not stuck in all the traffic.
never driven comb wash. I'm kind of excited to see what it looks like. We're just airing down because we have made it to Comb Wash Road, which follows this reef that you can see going off into the distance behind me. Uh, and we found this trail on Onyx, uh, bright blue trail. Looks like it's kind of a shortcut. Uh, we'll probably take longer, but it avoids all the traffic going around to the north towards Moab, uh, which we'd like, you know, obviously we'd like to avoid. I'd rather be slower on the trails than stuck behind a bunch of RVs heading north to Salt Lake City. Uh, good thing is it also ends up taking us up towards a ghost town that Justin found that he wants to take us to tonight to camp at. While unhooking the tire system, I noticed that something was wrong. Rob, tell me thoughts. What's in your brain? Um, uh, I, I was just don't know what's wrong with it, so we'll troubleshoot until we figure it out. Good thing is, right before this trip, we started selling these on revereoverland.com. So I bought one. It's like a sidewall patch kit, and that's usually how I end up having problems. But it comes with Colby valves. So worst case scenario, shove one of these in, and we'll be good. We're gonna try a new valve core first. Take the one out of my tire and shove this in and hopefully that fixes it. We could also just put the spare on, but that's such a pain. You got that little piece on it? I think that's just depressed on the one I've got. Like it's just stuck in and that's why it's letting air out slowly. So if we switch this out, hopefully that fixes it. There we go. So yeah, you can see, you can see the difference there between the two. So let's put the new one in. is easier said than done with the air coming out like this. I might have to just like pull all the airs out. Yeah. Hey. I did it. All right, now that we've fixed that, got air in the tires again, it's finally time to go. Rob, can you turn on your lights in the back? I literally can't see anything. Yeah, I can't see anything either. The drive along Comb Wash Road was free of traffic and had great views of the reef, but by sticking together for the drone shots, we were driving through a lot of dust. I gotta say, we got pretty lucky with a bright, clear sky today. It is just so clear back here. Okay, well, that's not what I mean. Well, that was a cool little shortcut. So now we are stopped, we're airing up. We're going back onto the highway. Need to get gas and uh, make our way up towards Moab and uh, hopefully avoid some of the traffic. Back on the highway, we made our way north through Moab and up to I-70 where we met up with Danny who would be joining us for a couple of nights. What's up? Okay, what's up? Super uh, galaxy path. No, actually. It's check it out. Like... We just met up with Danny at the weirdest gas station I've ever been to, uh, just off I 70 outside of Moab. If you've been to Moab off I 70, you know the one I'm talking about. Uh, and we're going to head out to the ghost town. There's a couple of ways of getting there. 
Uh, there is a, apparently what's a really cool route through some canyons, uh, and then there's the short way, which is just unpaved roads, a couple of straight unpaved roads. We're gonna go the short way, because you can probably see the sun is setting and it's almost dinner time. We're getting hungry. We wanna get there before both. On our way up through the canyon, we were on the lookout for a spot to camp. Thankfully, we knew there was a place at the ghost town. Darn it, someone's already camping here. Unfortunately, it was occupied, so we continued climbing the canyon, trying to find an area large enough for all five of us to fit. I just scrolled along the satellite view, and other than the wash, I don't see anything until we hit the end of this trail that's marked, uh, and then there's a clearing. All right, it's getting late, but we've finally found ourselves a pretty good spot to camp. Nice, wide, open area, and we have circled the vehicles. And uh, now we're gonna make some dinner. So Justin has brought the Howl fire pit with him. That is a $1,300 fire pit. I've heard it's supposed to be as good as a real fire. I'm still not convinced it's worth $1,300, but we'll see, it's pretty cold. I might be thankful he brought it. So it definitely has a lot more radiant heat than your average propane fire pit. Uh, it, but I think calling it as hot as a normal fire is a stretch. Maybe as hot as a really small normal fire that's burned down. I, I'll admit, it's nice to have. It's cold out here and uh, the radiant heat feels good. Uh, but I, <laughs> I wouldn't buy it. There's no way I'd spend $1,300 on it. I actually, I don't value fire at all on these trips, so I wouldn't even take it for free because it takes up so much space and uh, I, I just don't want to have to deal with it. But I guarantee people will buy it. Uh, in fact, they already sold out their first 300 plus that one, which is a demo unit that Justin borrowed. This is definitely an area where bears are possible. So last night, I took a couple of precautions with two new things that I picked up from Overland Expo East that I was at last week. One of them is a new motion sensor for the Devos Light Ranger, which uh, if someone goes near, or if an animal goes near, it will light up. It turns on for 
however long you set it, and shuts off again. So if something was creeping around camp, like bears, then uh, it would light up. And it did actually light up last night. I don't know why. I didn't see anything when I looked out the window. And the other thing was with the trash. Normally I'd leave trash in the front seat of the truck overnight, but it is particularly stinky, not just because of food, but because of diapers as well. So we took some of these little roller cams that I got at Overland Expo East. I grab hold of paracord on that end and can clip onto themselves or anything else on the other end. And uh, I threw it over some branches in the tree behind me and we hung our trash way up out of reach. Look at you, Andreas. You better get used to this, man. Look at this. Yeah. this Number this, one. And it flies away. Ready. This has never happened before. Waiting on Rob. How are the turntables? If you watch some of my older videos, I always had to wait around for Andreas, and now somehow he's the first one ready to go. I'm mostly there, I just gotta tuck it in and seal it shut now. We're all packed up, we're gonna head back down the trail we came up and back to the ghost town that we passed up last night. The name of this ghost town is Sago. Anything cool or interesting to tell me about it? Uh, I know that there used to be a house here. So this is Sago, and there used to be a house here. And within probably the last five years, it was standing and you could walk in it. But looks like Mother Nature got the best of it. There's an old car over there. Oh, That's I do like cool. old cars. How do I get over there? Not this way. Yeah, how do you get over there without dying? Founded in 1910, Sago was an important coal mining town. The coal was removed along the Ballard and Thompson Railroad, which was built by the town founders. Unfortunately, the water supply was notoriously unreliable. There often wasn't enough water to operate the coal washer, yet the railroad was regularly washed out by flash floods. The town struggled to be profitable through most of its existence, and a series of fires followed by a drop in demand for coal pretty much guaranteed its failure in 1955. All that remains today is the company store and the collapsed boarding house. Well, I think we came a little too late for the house, but I wonder what it used to be. Probably the local pub or the local Starbucks. I can see that, yeah. You can see the drive through the car's still in the drive through Oh yeah. Now we're going to head south to a campsite that I've wanted to stay at for a really long time. Uh, one that's got some of the best views in Utah. Some really cool scenery, really unique scenery. Uh, and I've never been able to camp there before because it's very high up and uh, it's been windy every time I've been close to it. So hopefully the weather cooperates today. But first, we're going to make a stop in Hanksville for some amazing burgers. Mm -hmm.
And this is the spot. I wanted to come here for years and uh, finally made it. And there's no wind. It's really, really pleasant. So we're all posted up, got our tents open. Actually, we're here a little early, which is good because we've all got work to do. Justin's in his camper working. Jevin's over there videoing for his video on uh, the DJI Pocket 3, I think. And then uh, Andreas is working and I'm about to get set up and uh, start transferring video footage on here and working on uh, my latest video. I think Danny's the only one who's not working. He's relaxing. Don't work too hard. This is obviously a very popular sunrise watching spot. We've got people set up all along the edge of the cliff with our cameras. We've got us here, obviously. Uh, we have a time lapse set up as well. Unfortunately, the time lapse was uh, probably ruined. We've got a guy that keeps walking through our camp. Uh, he came up, set up a camera right on the end in front of us, and then went out to the little spit of land that sticks out <laughs> right in everyone's shot. Uh, so I don't know how well the time lapse will come out with him in it. Well, the party is splitting up. Uh, Jevin and Danny had to leave first thing this morning. They've got some recording and sound work that they're heading out to do. Uh, Justin and Joe, who briefly stopped in last night, have to get home. That just leaves me, Elizabeth, the baby, and Andreas. And we're gonna head out to some roads that are the other side of Capitol Reef National Park. Andreas and I did them a really long time ago, and we've been wanting to go back, because uh, it was a lot of fun. It is air down time. Just got to basically the maintained section of the dirt road and uh, it might as well air down here just to smooth this part out. And then if this is anything like last time, there's one little creek crossing and then it gets to what I call like a mildly technical section, which I think is a lot of fun. We really, both of us, Andreas and I both really enjoyed it last time we came through here uh, because it's kind of technical enough to be fun and uh, you know, mildly challenging, but not enough to be really difficult. So should be through here in plenty of time to find ourselves a nice spot to camp.
road starts off following a wash that's fairly flat with a couple of tight turns. As you climb out of the wash, it gets more fun. There are off-camber sections, some small washouts, and mild rocky climbs. We really enjoyed it. Fun little trail. I like this one. Yes. Four low is on. I want to see if I'll have to uh, use the lockers at any point. Eventually, we made our way out onto the flats, where the road gets much easier, and we started thinking about where we could camp for the night. There's a lake off to the left on the map. You want to go see what it looks like? Uh, you know how I feel about lakes. I got my swimming suit. All right, let's go check it out. It looks really pretty. Yeah, it looks like it might have a good camp spot. sun is just setting over tonight's campsite and uh, it's a very different campsite from last night but just as pretty in a completely different way up here in the mountains we've uh, just finished making dinner it's microwave meals again tonight <laughs> we've been uh, I think every night so far I've done microwave meals it's just so much easier taking the kid so uh, just got battery set up inverter and bought a little $45 microwave from Walmart and then uh, we go to uh, right to Walmart again and get those Hormel pre-made meals like the beef stew, get the Bob Evans mashed potatoes, that kind of thing. Like it actually tastes really good. Uh, we did pizza the other night in the microwave and that tasted really good too. I will admit it's probably one of those things where it only tastes good while out camping. If we tried doing it at home it would be disgusting, but I'll take it. It's quick, it's easy, and uh, no washing up either.
It is a beautiful, calm morning this morning. I love this spot overlooking this little reservoir. Uh, and it is warming up now, the sun is up. Basically, as soon as the sun comes up over the horizon, it's nice and warm, it's very pleasant during the day. Although it has been pretty cold at night. The only thing, it should be named Funky, Funky Lake. It smells a little funky, but other than that, it's beautiful. Right now you can see the, the reflection of the mountains on the water because it's so still. I should get a little shot of that. Yeah. No, but I like it. We just pulled off the highway on this little side road because we need to stop and air up. There's a long stretch of pavement ahead of us and stumbled across this beautiful campsite. And uh, this is one of those spots that I think I'm going to save for future use. And uh, of course, because I'm tracking all this uh, and saving all these waypoints for Patreon as well, then that will be available for Patreon subscribers too. But while we were here, Andreas wandered off and I uh, heard him calling through the trees. He said, that there's a really cool view through these trees. Ooh. Once again, I'm having issues with the same valve core as, well, it's not the same one because it's a new one, but it's the same tire, same valve stem. It's got stuck. As soon as I pull off the Morflate, all that air is coming out again. So Andreas has, uh, he said he fixed the old valve core. He's brought the tool. We're gonna try switching it out and uh, hopefully, I, I don't know what's causing the issue. I've got a dust cap on this. It's not like dust is getting in and gumming it up. Um, yeah, he says that one's good. So we'll, uh, we'll switch it back in. I don't know what's causing it. I'm sure someone will know. I don't know if it's something with the Moraflate. I don't know if it's just I've had bad luck with two valve cores or if there's something with the stem itself. There it goes. Oh. Oh, I know what it is. I figured out what the problem is. It's not the Moraflate. It's not the valve stem. It's not the valve core. Balance beads. I use balance beads in these 37s. And there's a tiny little bead that's stuck in the back of this. And uh, it won't let it shut off all the way. There you go. So a little bit of wiggling and uh, it's fixed. I think the solution when airing up is going to be to pressurize the Morflate hose before plugging it into any of the tires. That way the beads hopefully get blown out of the back of the core. Uh, when airing down, I don't know. Um, it may be that it's best to use Andreas's air down tool instead of the Morflate system because that way I'm actually removing the valve core and uh, rather than pushing in on that little the little button in the middle of the valve core, I don't know what it's called, uh, and that way the, uh, the beads can't get stuck on it then. We're on a road just outside of Boulder that is part of a route that I created a couple of years ago that links all of Utah's national parks together using as many unpaved roads as possible. I tried to run it in April last year to see if it was feasible uh, and we were uh, held up by snow. So we're going to try this again. We'll see how good it is. Uh, this is all part of a system that I created just using uh, Paper Atlas and Google Maps and Onyx. So I don't know how good it is, uh, but we'll find out. This is the cabin air, uh, air filter. When, bad. when was the last time you changed it, or have uh, you ever changed I've it? I've changed it, but you know, I like to go out a lot. So, I mean, here's the, here's the proof. I'm sure there's Kentucky leaves here, all kinds of national park different leaves here, but yeah, we're, we're gonna need to clean this out. What, what was your first clue that it needed cleaning? Well, my uh, cold air wasn't coming out too much. It was just barely blowing, so, you know, that, that was the, the clue. This is kind of embarrassing. This just matches the whole truck. Filthy. I didn't end up leaking this time, so we uh, successfully aired down and uh, ready to go explore. Did you see 
see that sign this morning that said you should use four-wheel drive when you're going uphill to stop uh, washboards from forming? I don't know about you, but I'm loving this drive. It's definitely different from uh, the drives that we've done before. How about that for a bridge? The drive up into the mountains had surprised us with the incredible cliffs on all sides and the narrow bridge crossing the sheer drops. It's always nice when a random route picked from a map turns out to be as beautiful as this. At the top, we made our way across the plateau, which has flats between nine and a half and ten and a half thousand feet southeast towards Bryce Canyon. We found ourselves a beautiful spot to camp just outside of Bryce Canyon National Park. In fact, I can see traffic driving on the road into Bryce Canyon, but we've got a beautiful view across the reservoir behind me. I like this spot. This is a good one. And if you watched my Overland movie, this is actually one of the spots we tried to get to, but there were people out here. So we ended up camping further back in the tree line. It is a little windy out here, so I may keep that open as an option for us if we want to go somewhere a little more sheltered. It ended up calming down last night shortly after we got into the tent to basically what you have now, which is a very light breeze. So this spot worked out just fine. Uh, and today we're going to head across into Bryce Canyon National Park. That's going to be our son's 12th national park. Uh, so I figured since we're so close, might as well go. The park's actually about half a mile that way. But to be able to get to it or get to the main part of it, we have to go all the way back out to the highway, across and then back down to the little road that we can see just over there.
We're gonna continue on the route that I created that links up the national parks on dirt roads, this time heading towards Zion. And we've picked this up basically right underneath where we camped last night. This is the lake or the reservoir that we were overlooking. And I think our campsite, uh, I think it's one of the mountaintops, one of the hilltops over there. I don't know exactly which one, uh, but this is a really pretty area. Uh, just like last time, I don't know what this route's like. Uh, I just kind of picked this one up off the Atlas. It was just marked as an unpaved road. Awesome campsites on this road. Utah is by far my favorite state for overland travel because the scenery changes every 15 minutes, giving us fantastic variety in our trips and in my videos that are filmed there. This trail was a great example of it. It starts in the hills with views of Bryce Canyon style hoodoos, but as we dropped down, we entered a yellow rock canyon. The mountains of Ecuador look like this a little bit. That's cool, it's very pretty. We just reached the end of the unpaved road at a town called Hatch. Normally, if I wanted to continue the route that I created, we'd basically cross over and go up into the mountains on the other side uh, on unpaved roads still. However, it's getting late in the day. We need to make it down to a campground because we've got laundry to do tonight. Um, we are out of clothes. So we're airing up here in Hatch, uh, and then we're gonna head south on pavement to get to the campground. We got to camp just as sun was setting. We're here at the High Road Base Camp just outside of Zion. This is a great location because you are, I don't know, maybe half a mile away from the edge of the National Park. So uh, we like this spot just for that reason alone. It took us a lot longer to get here than we thought it would because once again, my tire leaked out. The same valve stem, the same valve core got gummed up with more beads. So I, I, I don't know really how to, uh, air up and air down without that happening. Um, I, I even pressurized the uh, more plate stuff beforehand and still had the same problem. So now we're gonna set up the tent, do laundry, shower, etc. because first thing tomorrow morning, we're gonna go into Zion. This is how we're gonna be exploring Zion. We've got e-bikes. It is my favorite way to get into the park because you don't have to ride on the shuttles. And it's just a lot of fun.
In the park, we did several hikes, which my son absolutely loves. I also enjoy showing him the sights and taking the time to let him experience the surroundings. Of course, we had to take him out to the lower end of the Narrows to let him play in the river. It was a perfect place to end our unforgettable trip in southern Utah. If you haven't already, you should subscribe to the channel. It's my goal to make it to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and it's a great way to make sure you don't miss any future trip videos. Thanks for watching.